Hi, happy Sunday, everybody. I miss you all, and you're all in my thoughts and my prayers all the time. Um, feeling blessed with the way that our country's handling the COVID. Um, can't wait to see you all in September. We'll all come up with a new norm together, and uh, may peace be with you. Welcome and good morning to Emmanuel United Church Worship Service. I'm glad that you have joined me and others to worship together in the name of Jesus Christ today. Let us acknowledge the land that we are worshiping upon. We come respectfully acknowledging that we live and worship on Treaty 20 lands. This treaty was made with a number of First Nations communities called the Michi Sagi. Treaty 20 is part of the Williams Treaty. These lands that we inhabit and worship upon are ancestral lands of First Nations communities of Alderville, Curve Lake, Hiawatha, and the Bruzele, Rama, Georgina Island, and Scugog Island. Our relationship with First Nations peoples have been impaired by our desire for ownership of the lands and its resources. These lands were once a place where many First Nations peoples raised their families upon, drew their livelihood from, and were stewards of the land and waterways entrusted to them by their ancestors. Over the decades, as settlers to this land, past and present, generations have dishonored the treaties that were made with the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island and now we occupy these lands. With the revealing of Canada's history through the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, it has exposed how we have treated our allies. We now seek out pathways for reconciliation, for right relations with all First Nation, Inuit and Métis peoples in Canada, restoring health and wholeness to our broken relationship and developing lasting harmony and peace between one another. And now let us light the Christ candle. We light this candle to remind us that the light of the world cannot be overcome by the darkness. Let our hearts trust in the living one who could not be imprisoned by death. Jesus Christ, the light of truth and peace and justice and love. I invite you to join me in as we begin our worship together in the call to worship. We are often troubled, but not crushed. We doubt, but never in despair. Sometimes we are surrounded by our enemies, but never alone. We know that the presence of, the, of Jesus surrounds us always. Glory to God whose name we give praise to in our worship. Amen. Now I invite you, if you have the Voices United Hymn Book, to join in singing three, seven, from 
number 377, Holy Spirit, hear us. you to join me in the opening prayer that you'll find on the screen or in the bulletin that you've printed off for this service. God, we come to praise your holy name and to let our hearts sing for joy. Guide our thoughts and our hearts in our worship to be attentive to you as we come together in faith to grow, learn, and to have our comfort challenged by your living spirit. Let your voice rise above the storms of life, the conflict, the hate. Help us to listen to your voice, leading us to pray together. Creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our next hymn is from More Voices, number 89, Love is the Touch. the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, verses 21 to 28, the faith of the Canaanite woman. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out to us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Then the woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread 
and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. May God bless to our understanding this reading from God's holy word. Amen. Some people say that life is a lesson. I think it is a good generalized statement that one can adopt, just as we can say that Jesus loves me, this I know. In Sunday school, we were taught that lesson, that God loves everyone, no matter their life situation, their race, or the color of their skin. Today, in this week's Gospel reading, we find a very uncomfortable reality that rears its ugly head. Jesus, in his response to the Canaanite woman whose daughter is suffering from mental illness, or as it was diagnosed then, tormented by demons, makes us feel uneasy, allowing the truth found in the hymn, Jesus Loves Me, to evaporate into thin air. For whatever reason, Jesus makes a right turn heading towards Tri and Sidon instead of a left one on his journey. There's no explanation as to why he got off the beaten track, maybe to find a, a bit of solitude after several preaching moments and healings and the feeding of the 5,000. But whatever it was, the disciples are in Canaanite territory, known as pagan land. According to Scott Jose, a biblical commentator, he writes, Jesus was outside of any recognizable religious area and had entered a kind of spiritual slum, a veritable ghetto of unbelief. This was a kind of place good folks did not visit. The disciples were probably nervous being there. To their provincial minds, trotting around and try and sit on felt spiritually downright dangerous. As they made their way through the region, a woman tracks them down, finds Jesus and his disciples. At first the disciples try to handle the situation, but somehow she breaks through the vetting team and is now in Jesus' face shouting, Son of David, have mercy on me, heal my daughter. The reaction that is given by Jesus to the request is not Jesus loves me, this I know. It is downright racist. A racist comment towards another human being who does not fit the religious profile 
in Jesus' mind. The Jesus loves me that creates this all-embracing individual now lies deep in the shadows of his own religious hatred, noted in the language used in his response to the woman's request for the healing of her daughter, calling her a dog. When I sing Jesus Loves Me, I realize that it is from a naive faith position, a faith that is simple and innocent, a faith that assumes that if we have Jesus, then we are loved, and so is everyone else. Jesus' position in this account amplifies the world's view on so many issues that is witnessed in how a person or a group of people respond to others. Walls being constructed to keep people out of countries. We have individuals demeaning one another human being. We have wars of isms on all sides. And we ourselves have at times spoken poorly about our neighbor next door. Or about a whole country that is halfway around the world, describing them as unappreciative, uncaring, unloving, or taking advantage of the social systems for their benefit, and so forth. The Jesus loves me, this I know, is really extended to others who are different from us. If this was so, this reflection would be obsolete. If Jesus remained true to his faith direction, as pointed out in Matthew, that started as far back as Joshua, through his leadership, the Jesus loves me, this I know, would have only remained in the Jewish circles. For, as Jesus stated in Matthew, as for Jesus, as stated in Matthew, came only to the Israelites and no one else. Biblical scholars and commentators over the years have tried to smooth out this wrinkle in this passage, revealing Jesus' character by pointing out that this was a teachable moment Jesus used for the disciples to illustrate God's love for all at the woman's expense. Or it was a test of faith for the woman who is relentless in her persistence for her daughter's healing. Others say that this uncomfortable scene was included for the purpose of pointing out the direction of the mission and ministry Jesus was about to take. We could end the sermon here and accept one or more of these avenues regarding this teachable moment contained in this passage. It was a teachable moment for the disciples of regarding the woman's lack of faith, then what was the point of it? How much more testing of this woman's faith was required? She probably sought out every avenue available to her, and it was met with failure. She had already placed her faith in Jesus as her last resort. Maybe I need to agree with the biblical commentators and make this an easy experience for us all that this half-crazed woman, this mother, whose sole desire was for the well-being of her daughter, found faith. Which, by the way, there is no evidence that she believed in Jesus before or even after Jesus healed her daughter. It is only assumed. But I can't. I believe that Jesus that day learned a major life lesson through this unknown an unnamed woman. Ever had one of those life lesson experiences? Many of us have experienced being caught stealing from a store by our parents. The parent, after speaking to, uh, to you about the criminality of stealing, hauls you down to the store you stole from to return the item and apologize to the sto store owner never promising never to steal again. For many of us, it was a very effective way of stopping a potentially habitual habit of taking 
from taking over one's life, possibly leading us to the darker side of life. The Canaanite woman was that parent for Jesus on that day. It is awful to think that this blue-eyed, blonde-haired Jesus that is portrayed in a painting that hangs in many of our Sunday school areas could have been a racist up to this point and potentially throughout his whole life if this Canaanite woman had not challenged him. The exchange of words were brief, taking Jesus by complete surprise after his demeaning comment washed over the woman. In spite of the painful sting of Jesus' comment that it was not fair to take good bread and throw it to the dogs, the quick thinking of this woman created an image for Jesus to chew on that even the dogs eat the fallen crumbs from their master's table. The comment changed his thinking about not only his feelings for the Canaanite woman's need, but his relationship with non-Jewish people. It was a life lesson that affected Jesus' view and of non-Jewish people. This life lesson sunk all the way into his inner being, changing his understanding of what Yahweh's kingdom here on earth was to be like. The outcome of such a lesson changed the disciples perspective and ministry direction as well. For the writer of Matthew, who was writing to the Jewish community, became a community life lesson that God did not just come to journey with the Jewish community as they had been taught, but that Yahweh embraced everyone. It must have been a hard pill to swallow and a harder personal challenge to live out as one of the top missional directions for this new way later to be called Christianity. So I ask you, what was, or maybe it's happening right now, the most difficult life lesson you, you have experienced and, have come to, and are coming to terms with? How has it affect your approach to various situations that you face? Along with these questions, I ask you, are you allowing your faith to help you make those necessary positive changes in your life that can become more life-giving and loving towards others? We have discovered the outcome of life lessons if they are positive. They can provide healing to, other, to others as shared with us by Matthew this morning. Even the crumbs that fall from the Master's table are vital for the sustaining of life of others. I do not want to leave you thinking today that Jesus was not loving. He was, but his sharing of that loving up to that moment was limited and his priorities were narrow. The lesson broadened his understanding. The lesson for us as a faith community is not just to focus on the in-community of our lives, but to be open to the leading of the Spirit that changes everything like the Spirit did for Jesus and the disciples' ministry. That takes everything we have to live for as a life lesson of loving our sisters and brothers as Christ loves us. Amen. Emmanuel United Church gives you thanks for the gifts that you have shared with the faith community over this past week. And so it is with a deep sense of gratitude for the blessings we have received let us present our offerings to God. Through our gifts, may Christ's healing and freedom be shared throughout creation.
Now let us uh, now let us ask God's blessing upon the gifts that we have shared. Holy One, we place our hope and trust in your loving kindness for all our needs. We desire to praise you with more than our words. Receive our gifts to support your mission, Jesus in the world. Bless these gifts and our energy so that all the world will know your loving kindness. Amen. Let us come before God with our thanks, with our concerns for our friends and family, and to share our lives with the Holy Other. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Creator of the vastness of the universe and all that it contains, in creation there is much joy and wonder We notice that the changing of the season is coming fast, where the mornings are becoming cooler and nightfall closes in sooner. As with the wonders of the world that encourages us to be open to God's presence, help us to believe that God is standing in the midst of much suffering and pain that exists in our world. Like Jesus, we hear the pain of many, but at times unable to give or to encourage or to respond to the needs of the many. Community after community face the uncertainty of COVID that has left us struggling and place fear and reluctance to give to the needs of our communities. The poor seem to be abandoned at times. The hungry go away empty-handed. And the unjust sentencing enter a lifetime of imprisonment or death. Our hearts are troubled and desperately want to respond in Christ's love to tend to the needs of a Beirut or the Philippines, the individuals who are fighting against the powers that take away rights and freedoms. Be with the parents who are struggling to make a decision as to whether to send their children to school. Let your spirit hold them to bring clarity as to what is best and the safest for their children. We pray for the teachers and administrators of the school, the bus drivers and support staff. As this unfolds, we pray for their health and their safety as well. Your faith community has been isolated from their community. As we prepare to place protocols into place and prepare for the reopening of the worship space. Guide us as well to ensure that the well-being of your people are our, pri are our most priority. During this moment we call upon you, upon your healing spirit, to be with those whom we love. Be there in the midst of our families, of our friends, providing comfort and the assurance that as they face these complex issues in their life, that you are there with them. Hear our prayer. Like the women, we seek out your presence too in our lives. So often we believe that we can handle and cope with all situations. But at times the burden becomes too heavy for us to bear alone. And so Lord, we pray for your presence 
to share that load with us. So hear our prayers. Creator, we give you thanks for your presence in your creation, for your presence in each of our lives, and with the assurance that you are there, supporting us in everything that we do. We give you thanks. Amen. And now I invite you to turn to the last hymn from Voices United, 510, We Have this ministry. Now let us go serving God, called to remove all that divides us from others. Let us go to share the grace of Jesus Christ, loving one another as we are loved. Let us go to be the Spirit's community, inviting all to join in the life and ministry of Christ. Let us go in the name of the one who created us, in the one who calls us and in the power of the Holy Spirit helping to restore hope, mercy, and peace in God's creation. Amen. Mm -hmm.